the war of the statues. They're toppling like ninepins across the planet. But how is that controversy playing out in Scotland, which has more than its share of historic monuments? We asked Scotland's leading historian, Professor Sir Tom Devine, to take a look at the issue. And then we asked Professor John Robertson about the mainstream media reporting on the issue. He casts a skeptical eye. All this on The Alex Salmon Show. Join us on air and online. Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show from stricken Aberdeenshire, where we look at how the current international controversy on statues and monuments is playing out in Scotland. The killing of George Floyd gave new impetus to the Black Lives Matter movement and reignited the argument about statues and monuments from the past, particularly those with an association with racism. In America, the heroes of the Confederacy are toppling like ninepins, both unofficially and officially. In the United Kingdom, the statue of Bristol merchant and slaver, Edward Coulson, ended up in the harbour. In Belgium, the statues of colonialist King Leopold II, which adorn the entire country, have come under attack. In Australia, a statue of British explorer Captain Cook has been defaced. And in Scotland, debate has concentrated on the statue of Viscount Melville, Henry Dundas, which bestrides the new town of Edinburgh. Edinburgh Council have authorised a new inscription for the statue, which details Dundas's role in delaying the abolition of slavery. So is this debate a healthy confrontation with the past or an attempt to eradicate history altogether? Today we turn to Professor Sir Tom Devine, Scotland's leading historian, to ask how a nation should confront the seamier sides of its own history. And how have the mainstream media been covering this controversial issue? We asked Professor John Robertson, who casts a sceptical eye over much of the reporting. All of this coming up later in the show. But first to Glasgow and Tasmina, with your tweets, your emails and your messages. Thank you, Alex. Last week's show focused on the impact of COVID-19 on black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. Well, we spoke with Dr Manish Talati, who lost his father to coronavirus. House of Lords Peer Baroness Manzala Udin and 100-year-old fundraiser Dabaro Chowdhury. Louisa says, I live in Africa and the numbers getting COVID-19 are exceptionally low. We have less than 200 deaths in Kenya. Angela says, how is it any government's fault that some people are more susceptible to COVID-19 than others? John says, it's more than obvious that the UK government have given up on trying to save lives and fighting the virus. Milena says, NHS is a government institution. Don't be so anti, because in the end, not one government knew how to deal with this terrible virus. Maureen says, they never tried to save lives. The only ones saving lives are the NHS. Barry says, first they're berated for locking down, then for locking down too late. Now they're taking too long to ease the lockdown, but people don't want to go back to work or send their kids to school. When will you be satisfied? And in response to the wonderful Dabro Chaudhry's incredible fundraising efforts for victims of COVID at home and abroad, Clem says, what a guy. William says, well done to that gentleman. May Gilchrist says, what a kind heart. Scott Hutton says, every step could have been their last. And finally, Stephen Johnson speaks for us all when he says, well done on raising that cash, sir. Few countries in the world have more of a, a built heritage of memorials and statues than Scotland from the castles and redoubts of the rural parts of the country to the civic grandeur of the great cities. More unusually, Scotland also has a number of what we might term people's monuments built by public subscription. Thus the Wallace Monument in Bridge of Allen from the 19th century or the Martyrs Memorial in Carlton Cemetery in Edinburgh. More recently, the, the statue erected to the hero of the governed rent strikes, Mary Barber. So these people's monuments contrast with the more established monuments of which we're more familiar. However, it would be fair to say there are probably more memorials to establishment figures 
The Duke of Wellington is famously parked in Royal Exchange Square, usually with a traffic cone on his head. Meanwhile, statues of Queen Victoria are all over the place, while the new town of Edinburgh is a Hanoverian name-fest of street names. Most controversial is the imposing statue to Henry Dundas, Viscount Melville, who ran Scotland for Pitt the Younger. It is this statue which has caused most recent controversy because of his role in delaying the abolition of slavery. To examine all of these issues, I turn to Scotland's leading historian, Professor Sir Tom Devine, who joins me from Hamilton. Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show, Professor Devine. Thank you for inviting me. Now, this statue war is uh, raging in America, across the world. Scotland has more than its fair share of statues, monuments, palaces, towers, street names. How is it playing out in Scotland? Well, certainly there's been the same kind of, if you, if you call it, verbal controversy and also in, in the media. But so far, we haven't toppled any statues. The only one that has come in for particular criticism is the statue of Henry Dundas in Edinburgh. But maybe because the actual plinth which supports the statue is quite high and the statue itself goes a fair bit into the sky, there hasn't actually been any attempt to take it down so far. What has happened there has been um, an attempt to revise the plaque at the bottom of the statue to demonstrate his role in delaying um, the bill to abolish slavery. Yes, I saw the inscription, the new inscription, which has been developed by Edinburgh Council, which, which pronounces uh, Dundas's role in the delay of the abolition of slavery. It, it doesn't give uh, much mention to his suppression of radical sentiment in Scotland, uh, where Dundas's role was pretty unambiguous. That is absolutely correct. In my view, in fact, if there is heinous behaviour by Dundas, it's actually in the suppression of radicalism, not on the extension of um, uh, the bill to, uh, to abolish slavery. Because if you look at the, the 1790s, the chances of slavery being abolished in that decade were zero, because Britain was at war with France. And there was no way it was going to destabilize the West Indies which was, of course, the jewel in the imperial crown in that period. So Dundas was a, a pragmatist on slavery, uh, but he was certainly not a pragmatist when it came to uh, banishing people to Botany Bay and, uh, and parts around the world for, for having such sentiments as uh, getting the right to vote and, and things like that. Dundas is a representative of you, like. He was known as the King of Scotland, because he was William Pitt's manager in Scotland, among a, a number of other uh, activities. But the, the threat posed by the radicals to the political establishment in the 1790s in Scotland was regarded as really very considerable. And so the state reacted very vigorously to that in order to snuff it out as quickly as possible by draconian means such as as you've said yourself, exile to the other end of the world. And how should Scotland address these conflicts in, it, in its history? Uh, the radical sentiment within many eras of, of Scottish society, which we, we prize now and, and point to, although there's not many statues to it, there's one or two, but not many, uh, or are we able to confront our role as part of the empire, as the butlers of the empire in one famous phrase. Is there a problem that Scotland has in, in looking at both sides of its story? Well, certainly until fairly recently, I would say perhaps the last 20 years, Scotland has really not faced up to some of the darker, if you like, the darker sides of its past. Um, and one major area there, um, of course, is empire. Um, Scotland was affected in every nook and cranny of its existence, materially, um, politically, culturally, socially, in occupational terms and the rest, by empire. It was at least as affected by it as England. The thing about it is, however, 
that that aspect of Scotland's past never had a high profile until the um, turn of the, the millennium. Um, I mean, my, my own book of 2001, Scotland's uh, Empire, as I called it, because of the extent to which Scotland was involved in the imperial project, uh, was the, the, the first, if not one of the first, to deal directly with the problem. Since then, there's been a lot of more work done and people are now much more aware of that uh, imperial role that Scotland had. So isn't there a, a sort of conflict in a way that the, the statues and the memorials predominantly, because largely they were built by the establishment, they tend to commemorate people who were part of that imperial role, whether it's Buchanan Street in Glasgow or Henry Dundas in the uh, monument to, in Edinburgh, it, where the, the, the actual history hasn't really confronted it and the teaching and education hasn't confronted it. It's something of an anomaly where the built infrastructure lauds those who were part of that project, but the, the history has tended to neglect them. Yes, but again, this is slightly, this is changing slowly. Uh, certainly, migration to the empire and even slavery, and it's got Scottish role in it, is being now taught in Scottish schools. Perhaps not to, this, to the extent that I would like to see, but it's certainly beginning there. And there are now books aplenty for any intelligent person to read about it. I mean, what I've been saying uh, in terms of the interviews I've given over the slavery controversy is, is that... Um, we now seem to be starting to move to a, a situation in Scotland where we are willing to look at our past, warts and all. It's not really developed fully, but it's on its way uh, at the moment. As you can see from some of the correspondence in the newspapers recently and also in social media. But there's also in Scotland a, a number of what could be called people's monuments, uh, which were done by subscription, usually like the Wallace Monument in Bridge of Allen or the Burns Monuments uh, uh, across the country, or the, the Radicals Memorial in Carlton Cemetery uh, in Edinburgh. Is it unusual to have these people's monuments uh, that Scotland has? I think you put your finger on a, a significant point. To my knowledge, this um, development, really from about the... 17th, 18th century onwards, and especially to do with people like Robert the Bruce and William Wallace, but then the, the Scottish martyrs thereafter and some radical uh, politicians uh, and uh, of the 19th century. Uh, that does seem to have, I wouldn't say unique to Scotland, but I think there's a distinctive aspect to that. As, for example, the democratic movement developed in 19th century Scotland, leading up, of course, to full um, suffrage and emancipation in the early part of the 20th century, there seems to have been a desire for, if you like, on the part of ordinary folk to have their own heroes on pedestals. And the that process continued, we saw just in the last few years, the a monument to Mary Barber, the hero of the, the govern rent strikes of 1915 was erected in Glasgow. Is that another aspect of people trying to rediscover part of the, the history, which again has been largely neglected in, uh, in orthodox teaching? Well, there is the fact that um, these statues we talked about earlier, if you like, the statues of the empire, reflected the views of the elite of the time. These new um, artefacts which are being put up reflect the, the, the nature of ourselves today as a democratic society. And one of the interesting things that's happened in the last 10 to 20 years has been the recognition that women's impact on our society has been grossly underrepresented in, in, our, in our histories until, as I say, recently. So that's, that's why this new tendency to accept the role of women, to praise, if you like, to remember people like Barber, um, is a very interesting part of our age. And that has, reflects the fact that, you know, we are moving hopefully rapidly towards more gender equality uh, in society. Join us after the break, where we continue our discussion on the statue wars with Sir Tom Devine. 
Welcome back. I'm discussing the current controversy over statues and monuments with racist connections with Scotland's leading historian, Professor Sir Tom Devine. So out of these controversies and Black Lives Matter, the, the importance of uh, balancing the, the, uh, the role of women in, in history, uh, and also other aspects like the, uh, the one of your own fields of expertise, the clearances uh, of Scotland, the uh, erection some 10 years ago of a, a monument to those who were cleared in Helmsdale as a counterpoint to the, the Duke of Sutherland's uh, statue, which uh, overlooks a large part of the, the Highlands. Are all these things uh, an attempt to rebalance history to give a, a broader aspect? Uh, and are they a good thing? In a more, in a greater, in an age of greater equality and de democratization, it's inevitable that the the lives of ordinary people, and especially in your, the case you mentioned of the clearances, the um, uh, some some of the uh, the, the extraordinary um, uh, uh, sinister aspects, if you like, the way in which people's lives were adversely affected, um, should be memorialized and are being memorialized in terms of the example you gave. So if I was to say, let's uh, appoint Scotland's leading historian, uh, Professor Devine, uh, to adjudicate on uh, which uh, statutes should be toppled, which should be replaced, which should be explained. Is there a, a route by which we can come to a, a settlement on, on these matters? Or is it a, a, a point of taking it case by case? Well, I mean, I give you my own opinion, really based on my trade, which is the profession of historian. Um, I'm against the removal of these statues um, because they represent the way at least some of our ancestors, usually elite ancestors, thought. I would say that statues, street names, and not least buildings, because in Glasgow in particular, but in other parts, of urban Scotland, there are there are there are um, buildings which were erected by people who made a lot of a lot of money out of chattel slavery uh, in the Caribbean and in the thirteen American colonies before 17, 1776. What I would like to see, of course, is clear indication um, by either uh, multimedia or by plaques but plaques well designed to catch people's attention to explain why Buchanan Street is called Buchanan Street and why there has been a furore over it. Um, and that would, that would be a, an excellent way of maintaining the, if, if, if you would call them the artefacts of the past, but adding an additional element of explanation. So I don't like to see the past censored in any way and taking down statues, um, uh, in my view, is, 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 is an act almost of historical vandalism. If I can give you a, a small memory from my own student days, uh, uh, Sir Tom, I uh, raised the question of the 1820 radical rising in a lecture by uh, Norman Gash, the Peelite historian, uh, and was fairly summarily dismissed as a as an impudent young student. Uh, are you looking forward to the day that perhaps Scottish students will be able to, to raise these matters <laughs> against historical orthodoxy? Or indeed, has that day arrived? No, no, I mean, I, I, um, I, some, of, uh, some of the best ideas I've had, indeed, some of my own research projects have come out from uh, sometimes passionate discussion with undergraduates um, and also with graduate students. Um, in tutorials and seminars. Um, I mean, one of the reasons I looked at the, the, the stability of Scotland during the agricultural revolution in the lowlands was because it came out of a student discussion, and that was a, that was a, number, of, a number of years ago. Any, any effective university teacher has got to teach, has got to try and move the students in an independent framework of mind because the essence of my great discipline history is to try and get people to think for themselves in a disciplined and systematic way, to, to be able to move away from assertion into arguments supported by relevant, relevant evidence. 
And it might well be that your former professor, Alex, uh, uh, didn't have that kind of mentality in that particular period. Um, the more controversy in a tutorial, the more passionate uh, interchange of views, the more attacks on the teacher, then that's a sign to me that you are dealing very effectively with your students. And finally, uh, Scotland's most eminent historian, is there a message for the country uh, about the importance of understanding history, warts and all, good and bad? How should a, an ancient nation like Scotland have the ability to face up to all aspects of its rich and varied history? The, the vital point is to look at all aspects of the past in a kind of balance. History is the social memory of society. If you, if you do not have any understanding or attempt to have any understanding of the past, you do not know how we came to be the way we are. And not only that, the, the sense of being aware of what, where we came from. Otherwise, we don't really have any anchor by which to, if you, if you, if you will, guide us in the future. Professor Sir Tom Devine, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it very much. An interesting aspect of this current controversy over statues and monuments is how the mainstream media have covered these uh, attacks on the, the past heritage, both official and unofficial. I covered this with uh, Professor John Robertson, who joins me from here. Professor Robertson, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you for having me. Uh, how have the uh, media in general been covering this uh, war of the statues, both uh, internationally here in Scotland and in the, the rest of the UK? Those campaigning, those uh, tearing down statues, are concerned with real social change. The, the tearing down of the statues is, 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 is something very easy for the media to deal with. It's something they find appealing. They can, they can obviously make a great deal of it. And, and in some respects, it takes away from the actual campaign for real social change. And I think that's the, the first thing to say about that. And I think that's, for a long time, been a problem with state and corporate media. Well, you say for a, a long time, Professor Robertson, but hasn't that always been the case through history? I mean, if we go back to the American Civil War, then the Glasgow Herald, as it was then, was solidly for the Confederacy. That would seem to have something to do with the tobacco interests in Glasgow. And even the Manchester Guardian, that... that uh, that towering vehicle for liberalism was supporting the Confederacy, which might have been something to do with the fact it was founded by the, the cotton interests. As you say, going back a very long way, and, and quite apparent, I think, in 2003, when the, the saturation coverage of the toppling of Saddam's statue in Baghdad um, gave people the impression the war was over and that, that a clean end had been, had been achieved there and, to some extent, concealed the horrors that were to follow from that, that mistaken uh, military adventure. Professor Robertson, how would you assess the metropolitan media's uh, coverage of the, the demonstrations that have taken place in London and elsewhere? Has there been any recognition that this might be something to do with Britain's imperial past? Has there a change for the better in terms of that coverage, or is it basically just as bad as ever? I, think, I don't think anyone's prepared now to stand up for the excesses of the, the British Empire. Um, they, they have certainly retrenched to some extent. I think the Scottish media, the Scottish media are not really paying an awful lot of attention to some of these global issues because they are so obsessed with the, the constitutional issue. It, the, this battle for control of the, of the mind and souls of the, of the Scottish people now, which is becoming quite intense, as you'll know, opinion polls now showing support for independence, solidifying in, in the 50s now, um, and since, since the turn of the year, opinion poll after opinion poll suggesting a bit of a kind of sea change there. The, the, the mainstream media are clearly in a state of panic now and, and, and reporting in almost kind of parodic ways to try and find a way of somehow weakening the, the surge towards independence. So, Professor Robertson, finally, would you say that change that you detect in UK media coverage is because of the the appalling scenes in terms of the murder of George Floyd, or, or is it rather a, a sign of the times that Black Lives Matter is treated more sympathetically now uh, than it was a few years ago when, when the movement first started? 
maybe I'm being pessimistic, I'm not too sure that linkage is there, that we have a shift in, in media coverage, a welcome shift towards a more emancipatory perspective on things. But whether or not, and, and unless, of course, there is a change of government, I think if there is a change of government, just about any change from the, the Johnson regime might actually allow some real change to take place. Professor John Robertson from here, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure, absolute pleasure. Enjoyed it. The War of the Statues has taken place in a heightened atmosphere in mid-pandemic in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd. Thus, after many years of unanswered peaceful persuasion, the statue of Edward Coulson ended up in Bristol Harbour. Other targets for the protesters' wrath are, are much more ambiguous. Few would deny Churchill's Edwardian racist views. He treated the miners very badly. He gassed the Kurds. But that is counterbalanced by his supreme role in the Second World War as the leader in the struggle against fascism. Henry Dundas's position as William Pitt's parliamentary fixer means it could be argued he delayed the abolition of slavery. But equally, his supporters would say that his amendment made its abolition possible. However, his role in the suppression of radical dissent in Scotland has no case for the defence. There is nothing sacrosanct about a nation's built heritage. Every generation has the right, if it so chooses, to change it, to alter it. But it should be done from the basis of knowledge. At least this lively debate is ensuring that countries all over the world are confronting some of the difficult realities from the past. And nowhere is this debate more lively or more difficult within Scotland with its twin role as a centre of radical thought and also as an enforcer of the imperial project. And therefore nowhere has education a more vital role. Perhaps the last word in this controversy and perhaps even a solution can be found in the highlands of Scotland. After generations of various conspiracies about perhaps blowing up the Duke of Sutherland's statue, overlording it over Golsby. Some descendants of those that that Duke cleared from the land combined to build a wonderful monument in the town of Helmsdale, a monument to those who were cleared as opposed to the Duke who did the clearing. That gives a different aspect, perhaps a more enlightened aspect in history and also perhaps is a solution capable of general application. And so from myself, Tasmina, and all at the show, it's goodbye for now, stay safe, and we'll see you again next week.